Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room, formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing to buy a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me, for this is my God, and do not blot out what I have also what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. This is what the word of the Lord. Thanks. This is the word of God. Thanks be to the Lord. Let's continue to read, read Nehemiah chapter 13 from verse 15. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this to, into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some, some of my own men at the gates so that no Lord could be brought, it, brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of, uh, one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take, a, take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he, he was led into sin by foreign women. 
must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat and Horonite, the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priest and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contribution of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. Amen. Well, let's pray before we come to God's word. Father, we thank you for the word which was just read to us. Aren't we a privileged people to have your word written to us? And Lord, that we have the opportunity to read it and Father to um, yeah to listen to your word and this morning we have the opportunity to think about what it means to us today so Father may you give us your grace to understand not only understand but Father to put your word into practice and we ask this for your glory in Jesus name Amen uh, please keep that uh, Bible reading open in front of you. There will be a few other Bible verses that are, I'm going to use today. Um, and uh, it'll come up on the screen. Um, so hopefully it'll all go well. Uh, one of the things that I must admit is I'm not a movie buff. Right? So I don't go to watch movies. I happen to watch movies. Um, but if I'm going to sit for 90 minutes or more in front of a, a movie, I'd like it to end well, right? We, we are happy to go through the drama, the twists, the turns, the emotions, the frustrations, as long as we know the end is going to be really good. We want the hero to win. We want the couple to live happily ever after. But sadly, not all the movies end this way. If you are um, in the era of Titanic, you, and you might know like it doesn't end really happily. And also, um, if you have watched the movie A Walk to Remember. Who has watched that movie, Walk to Remember? Yeah, it is a very sad end ending movie. And I am also told, I haven't watched this, but Terminator 2, uh, Judgment Day, and also um, Avengers, Infinity War. Is that correct? Yeah. Those two movies, movies also end with a bit of a sad note. All right? So some of these movies had to come up with sequels to actually make the movie end in a happy note. So now, the book of Nehemiah could have ended very well at chapter 12. We saw last week, right? The, the temple is built, the wall is rebuilt, people have the word of God, the covenant is removed, God has forgiven their sins, everything is going well, and to cap off everything, we see this great time of celebration in chapter 13. Now, that is a good place to stop that story, right? But Nehemiah doesn't. He kind of forces us, he compels us to read chapter 13. And we learn there, after uh, this great celebration in chapter 12, Nehemiah goes back to Babylon for a bit of a con um, considerable time. Um, and then when he is away, while he is away, Things seem to have fallen apart. There is a series of failures. Now, I don't want to bore you with the details again, which we just read. Uh, you, want, you may want to reread uh, that chapter again at your leisure, but in short, verses 4 to 9, they have desecrated the temple of God by allowing Tobiah, one of the enemies of God's people, a non believer, to reside inside the temple courts. Verses 10 to 13, we find uh, the people have ignored the 
temple, the temple of God. They have stopped bringing their tithes and offerings to the temple, so the Levites who depended on the tithes and the offerings of the people, they had gone back to work in their fields, leaving the work of the temple behind. Verses 15 to 22, uh, we hear that the Sabbath law has been broken by people working and buying and selling off stuff on the Sabbath day. And verses 22, 23 to 28, people have actually compromised their identity as God's people by marrying uh, from people around the nation of Israel, from marrying, uh, by marrying non-believers. You may remember at the beginning of the sermon series, while we were still doing um, online worship services, we said, the book of Nehemiah is the last record that we have of the people of God before Jesus was born. So this is actually how the people of God were living before Jesus came into the scene. You see, God had called the people of Israel to be holy because he is holy. But at the end of the Old Testament, uh, we find the people struggling to live up to their calling. Although Nehemiah, I mean, he takes some very drastic actions, doesn't he? He's pulling head, hairs off from people and he's beating some and he's rebuking. The book ends with this very sad note. It ends with a bit of a frustration. There are, there are serious doubts about the people's ability to be holy ever again. It's kind of a very sad ending, not only to the book of Nehemiah, but to the whole of Old Testament. So what do we learn from this chapter, this chapter of gloom. And I want to point four lessons this morning. Holiness is a heart issue. Back in chapter 10, you may remember, uh, they were so excited when they heard the word of God. So they had the word of God. They had Ezra and the Levites who taught and explained the word of God. And Nehemiah basically acted like a policeman, a big brother, who made sure that the people were doing the right thing. And as we saw, people made a, a written covenant and they signed and sealed it and said, we're going to obey everything from here on. Now, these are all good things, right? But none of these made the people holy. And this chapter confirms what the whole of the, whole of the Bible kind of talks about. In Isaiah, you will remember God said, these people come near to me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful, of, deceitful above all things beyond cure. And Jesus said the same thing, right? In Matthew chapter 15. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Did you hear that? Heart is the issue. The problem lies at the heart. As long as our hearts are unholy, we are going to remain unholy. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, we find these words, God promising actually to deal with the heart. Yeah, he says, I will give you a new heart and put you Put in you a new spirit. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my ways. And when we come to the New Testament, when Peter stands and, and preaches on the day of Pentecost, he preaches to all the Jews, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, we're told that they were cut to their heart. You see what is happening here? God has begun the work that he said, the surgery that he would perform in the heart. And the Apostle Paul says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is now a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And he reminds us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we, each one of us, is a temple of God. That his spirit now dwells in us. You see, his spirit has begun this good work in our hearts, the work of transformation of our heart. Because, friends, holiness is a heart issue, and God is dealing with that heart issue, the issue of holiness in our hearts. Which means, friends, the second lesson that we learn from this chapter is, like the Israelites, we too must be looking forward. Those of us who have been Christians will agree uh, with us that we are no different to the people of Israel in Nehemiah's day, right? Right? I have been a Christian now for 22 years, 23 years, and I have the Spirit of God in me, but I still sin. I struggle with temptation. I, my, my eyes, my mouth, my, my heart, my mind, my hands, they do things that I don't want to do. I feel horrible. I feel wretched. I, like the Apostle Paul in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, I look forward for that day when God would rescue me. Uh, he would relieve me of this sinful, fleshy body and clothe me with his glorious body, the glorious body of our Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but I really look forward for that day. And the New Testament actually helps me to look forward for that day because the New, Set, New Testament uh, promises this very thing, right? It promises the sequel, the better ending to our story. Paul ends the letter to the Thessalonians, the first letter to the Thessalonians with these words. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole body and spirit and soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And when we look at the book of Revelation, when we look at Revelation chapter 21, the heaven is described as a place where there is no sin nor sinners. Which means, friends, in the midst of sin and, and temptation, we must not lose hope. We must confess and, and repent and ask forgiveness for our sins, but we must look forward we must remind ourselves of that final goal, of that final beautiful picture that God paints for us at the end. Because we are unfinished work, friends. We are a work in progress, and, and God promises, doesn't he, in, 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 in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, the good work that he has begun, he will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. We look forward for that day. But there's a third thing that we learn from this chapter. While we wait, we also must be proactive in pursuing holiness. If you, if you are listening to Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah was very uh, he was a very busy man, wasn't he? He was very active 
In verses 8 and 9, he, he got rid of Tobiah's things from the temple courts and, and he's purifying the rooms and then he, he's putting back things into the temple, the temple equipments, and he's bringing back the grain and the offering back to the temple courts. In verses 11 to 13, he rebukes the people for not uh, bringing their tithes and offerings to the temple. And he appoints new managers to the storerooms. In verses 17 to 21, he not only rebukes people for breaking the Sabbath law, no, he actually uh, puts guards at the door. He appoints people. He shuts the door on the Sabbath day so that people won't do the wrong thing. In verses 25 to 27, he's so busy. I mean, he's disciplining people, beating them, and he's pulling out hair, and he's rebuking them, and he made them an oath. He got them to sign an oath again to stop doing this intermarrying again. You see, Nehemiah was so proactive in dealing with unholiness and sin. And if you read the Bible, Nehemiah is not alone, right? In Psalm 119, verse 11, David says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Job 31, Job says that he has made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look at a woman with lust. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, the apostle Paul calls Timothy, train yourself. Now that is an active thing. It is a training yourself to be godly and holy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul asks the Corinthians to flee, run away from sexual immorality. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul asks the Christians to put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And the whole purpose of putting the armor of God is to resist temptation. And you may remember the harsh words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. He says, if your, if your eye is causing you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand is causing you to sin, take it off. See, we too must have, friends, strategies to deal with sin and temptations. For example, if you're struggling with pornography or lust, you might want to install this program called the Covenant Eyes in, your, in all your electronic devices. Get some help. You might mind, you want to find uh, an accountability partner, someone whom you can trust, someone whom you can give the permission to ask hard questions from you. And if you have a problem with wasting time in front of the computer, now who doesn't have a problem with that? Right? We might want to uh, maybe delete some of the games that we are playing. Or some programs that are, that are keeping us busy. Uninstall them. If you are influenced by non-Christian friends, maybe perhaps that is, it is a time now to unfriend them. Cut down those relationships. Or maybe limit some of those friendships. And if the Facebook or Instagram, is, if that is keeping you away from God, you might have to put a strategy to, to limit your access. And if, you have, if you're struggling taking your Sabbath day off, maybe it is time to plan ahead. Speak to your boss if he's putting you on a roster to work on a Sunday. Or you might want to find another day of the week to take your Sabbath day off. You see, friends, while God is at work on making us holy, while we look forward to the day when God would completely make us sinless, God expects us that we be proactive in becoming, pursuing holiness. But I don't want to leave us 
thinking, well, okay, it's all got to, got to do with me. I'll, I'll have to do all these things and I'll be okay. And it, it's up to me. But I want to leave you with two final thoughts about holiness. Holiness is God's grace. Holiness is God's grace. You see, as you read through this chapter, chapter 13 of Nehemiah, after each reform that Nehemiah brings, he does this interesting thing. He prays. He comes to God in prayer four times. Verse 14, and in the second half of verse 22, and again in verse 29, and again at the end of the chapter, verse 31. Like we have seen in the rest of the book, Nehemiah lives with this constant awareness of God. He is solely dependent of God's grace, isn't he? He understands that, that all the things that he is putting into place, all the discipline that he is taking, all the measurements that he has taken, nothing is going to do anything unless God has mercy on him and on the people. He understands the importance of God's favor, God's mercy. And that is something that we must always remember, friends. It is God who gives us the grace to act. He is the one who gives us the grace to be strong, to plan, to flee, to, to order our lives so that we can be holy. And we must depend on God's grace to be holy. And the second thought that I want to leave us with is this. Holiness is for God's glory. Holiness is for God's glory. Now, if you notice, after each of these prayers, he, he, he begins each of these prayers with the word remember. God, remember. Or notice, he's asking God to notice what he has done. In other words, we see a man who is doing whatever he has done for God, isn't he? He's doing all what he is doing for the glory of God. There's nothing in it for him. He's not doing it to be a show off. He, well, he's not looking for praise from people, not from a, not from a king. No, he was constantly seeking God's approval. God was his audience, right? God was his audience. And God is our audience, friends, wherever we are. People may not be watching, but God is watching. And he takes pleasure when we try to live our lives to honor him, when we live our lives in his holy ways. And at the end of the day, what matters is God's pleasure over our lives. And this should be our, our aim of holiness too, friends. Whatever we do, let us aim to do it to please God. Let us be holy for God's glory. Let us be holy so that at the end of the day, God will be glorified by our holy living. You see, friends, when we watch movies, if, if it is a sad ending movie, if there's going to be a sequel, there is some sort of a hint, right? Maybe a scene that is hidden there somewhere or, or a statement to say, well, I'll be back. Something like that. In Nehemiah 13, it gives us a clue that this is not the end of the story. They were looking forward for the day when Jesus comes and, and refreshes their hearts and put his spirit on the people. And was looking forward for a sequel. And friends, our story is not over yet. We look forward for a sequel. And we know that sequel is coming because God has promised that it is going to come. God says that he will make everything new. And we look forward for that day. And until then, friends, 
We must look forward. We must trust in God's promises. We must continue to allow God to make our hearts holy and clean our hearts daily. And we must trust in God's promises that he so dearly, so faithfully gives us. And we must be proactive. Proactive by using the God-given tools, using God's grace to be holy, because he calls us to be holy. Don't you look forward for that day when this sickly, sinful bodies are taken away and that he has replaced them with the righteousness and the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious body like of our Lord Jesus Christ. I do. And we should too. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity for us to spend some time in your word. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, you call us to be holy. You call us to be holy because you are holy. And Father, we, we thank you this, this journey of holiness. You don't want us to, you don't call us to go on our own. You go with us. You make our hearts holy. You transform our hearts. Father, we look forward for that day. That your promises of this new creation realizes. That we'll be clothed with the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, until then, give us your grace to deal with sin, deal with unholiness, to, or to look forward for that day, not to lose hope, not to give up on being holy. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you afresh again, and we ask for help this morning to be holy. In Jesus' name, for your glory. Amen.